you have your Bibles, turn to Psalms 37. Psalms 37. I'm in a second part of our, our series on uh, what it means to trust God. Uh, Jared asked me last week, we did trusting God, and he said, what, what do you call it? What's the name of the sermon? I said, part one. So decided this week we're going to call it part two. I think we're going to have probably about seven. I don't know. Um, sometimes I can add two, and I don't need to do that too much. But uh, I love Psalms 37. As a matter of fact, I think it's, I don't think I know, it's my favorite psalm uh, of all of them. There's, there's some favorites in there. There's some good ones in there. There's uh, some that have really blessed me. But I don't know that there's any psalm that has blessed me as much uh, as this one has. And when you start thinking about what David was going through in verse 25, he says, I once was old, or I, I once was young, but now I'm old. So he was saying this is looking back on a lifetime of experiences. Uh, and when we look at his life, he had a lot of difficulties. He had a lot of things that he had to walk through. As a matter of fact, if you want to compare your life with someone else and you see someone that God blessed as much as God blessed David, then you look at all the things that he had to walk through. It's, it was a difficult time in his life. But yet, wisdom comes through experiences. Going through hardships and pains and seeing the, the goodness of God, the blessings of God, and what God can do during those times. There's a, there's a greater understanding. As a matter of fact, I think the greatest thing that, can, that any of us could ever learn and all of life is to learn that there is a God who loves us and that He wants to, to, uh, for us to know Him. He wants to invite us in. He wants us to uh, share in all the blessings that, that He so very much wants to give. He wants us to know Him and He wants us to let Him be Lord of all of our life. The good, the hard, the difficult. He wants to be Lord. He wants to be Master. He wants to be God in all of those areas. But to do this, we're going to have to learn to trust Him. We're going to have to learn to trust Him. Now, He created us in this veil of humanity. And that means that um, we know what we know and we trust what we can see. And we don't trust, we, there's some things that we may know in theory, in part, but there's some things that we're not too sure that we uh, fully understand and we're not going to trust them if we don't fully understand them. As a matter of fact, I, I think uh, in our sinful nature, what we try to do is we try to bring God down to our level, to where we can understand God. And by the way, we judge God by our standards. And we expect God to do what we think and what we want and what we believe. And that's because of our humanity and our understanding that comes from it. But God's Word said His ways are far beyond our ways. His thoughts are beyond our thoughts. So when we, if we could come to this place of knowing God in all of His wisdom and all of His love and all of His strength and all of His sovereignty, then we could understand Him. We need to know that, that He is a God that is complete wisdom. We need to get to the place where we understand that He has amazing love. We need to understand that He has unmatched strength and that there is a divine, fully God sovereignty over all the areas of our life. So instead of trying to bring Him down to our level, why don't we allow Him to... Uh, to, to roll back the curtain and let us see the purity of who He is and what He has for us and what He's planned because it's all good. He has so much good for us, but sometimes we just don't see it because sometimes all we see is the ugliness that's in this world. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say that? There's some things that you don't understand, some hardships and some pains in this world some things that you'd rather not have to deal with. And usually it deals with people. That's where David's hardest trouble was, was dealing with hard people. People sometimes who knew better, but didn't care. Sometimes they could talk a good talk, 
They just didn't want to live the good talk. Sometimes the only thing that was important to them was their way. And they do whatever, to whomever, however it took it, just so that they could feel comfortable in their own thoughts and in their own skin and in their own lives. And we've seen that. Matter of fact, you've probably, you've, you've probably uh, felt the brunt of it. Have you ever been used? You ever been abused? You ever felt like uh, you were just uh, someone that someone could step on? They didn't really care? Well, we've all been there. And I think that's the thing that uh, David knew and understood when he wrote this psalm. It troubled him when he could see so much of the ugly was there, but he wanted to trust in God. So in Psalms 37, verse 1, it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Then he makes this powerful statement. Don't fret, but trust in the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I know you see us. You know where we are. You know what we faced. You know the burdens that we bear. Some of those are of our own doing. Some of those are just the overflow of the ugliness of this world that it's just been distorted. It's not the way you created it. It's not the way you wanted it. And it's not the way your heaven will be. But Lord, there's so many wrong things that happen here. And Lord, I, we don't always understand it. Difficulties. I dare say pains. And Lord, we, we push back against those things. And Lord, we know that you're God. We believe that. And we know that you're on the throne in heaven with all the power to, of all the universe. And yet when we see the ugliness there seems to be a dissonance or a disconnect. Lord, uh, we don't understand why. And Lord, sometimes because of that, we, we don't know that we can trust you because we don't understand all of your ways. But Lord, we know that we need to. And I pray, Lord, that today, through the power of your word, through the anointing of your Spirit that speaks, Lord, that you would help us. Lord, that you would help us to hear from you. Lord, that you would heal us and show us your ways. And Father, be loving, be kind, be patient, and be tender. But Jesus, be Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. David spent a lot of time when he was young. As a pre-teenager and as a young teenager, he spent a lot of time out in the fields tending the sheep. He probably wanted to do it. It was probably one of those things that when he was a young person, he was kind of drawn to it. He probably asked his father, Jesse, if he could do that. And it was seemly, seemed that that was one of the things that he was drawn to and be out there to care for them. Now, that was a tough job. It didn't really matter the weather. You had to be there. It didn't really matter if it was daylight or dark. You had to be there. They needed someone to take care of them because they were dumb, they were stupid, they were ignorant, and they could not take care of themselves. Kind of like pastor in church. And yet, he learned that in those times that there was a great God that was there. When I was thinking about when I went to seminary, I went to a class called uh, Christian Theology. And in the very first class, in the first 10 minutes of the class, the professor gave us our, 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 uh, the, the book that we would be studying and it was called Christian Theology. It was written by a man by the name of Fisher Humphreys. And he said that in the very first 10 minutes, he said that, that 
Christian theology was defined as thinking about God. When you're thinking about God, when you're thinking about who He is, when you see the nature that is out there, when you see how the, the butterflies float around, how the hummingbirds can just stop and flutter their wings, and you see the beauty of the flowers, and, and you feel the cool breeze as it comes across your face. And when you go out at night and you see the stars, and you're amazed by all the awesomeness of all the wonder of the creation of God, and you know that He's there, and you begin thinking about God and, and all of His love and, and all of His kindness, you're actually being a theologian. That is the definition. When you are thinking about God, that is doing theology. And in the young boy, David's life, as he was out there by himself with those sheep, tending them, leading them to the green pastures, leading them beside the still waters where they could drink, watching over them with his rod and his staff to protect them. And when the dangers come, it was his responsibility to step up and to help them, no matter what. When he began to think of who he was in the light of God and that, that, that God was the great shepherd, you know, he did write Psalms 23. And he knew that the, as long as God was his shepherd, he did not want that God would lead him. Even if he went through the valley of the shadow of death, God would be there with him. And he began to have a love for God. As a matter of fact, he began to express in his own life that love for God. And that's what he would do when, in, in his own life. He would sing unto God and he would think of words. And he was a great hymn writer. As a matter of fact, that's what Psalms 37 is. It is a, a song written to God as he thinks about his life, and he thinks about who God is for him. It was written when he was old, and he looks back on his life and, and all of the twists and turns and all of the difficulties and all of the hardships that he went through. And yet, through all of those things, he knew that there was a God that was there for him, listen to me now, and that he could trust in God. David's greatest desire was to please God and be faithful to Him in all of His ways. Is that your desire today? Do you want to put a smile on God's face? Please Him? Let Him know that on the good days you love Him and on the hard days you love Him more? When things are the way that please you, that you're grateful but when things are difficult and hard, you still trust Him even then. Matter of fact, does it bother you that there are difficulties? Does it bother you that sometimes it seems like people get by with things that are not right? That was David's trouble. Sometimes he would look at God and how great God is, but then he would look at people and he would see the things that are going on and it bothered him. You ever thought about those people that they don't care about you? They try to step on you. They use you for a step stool to get something else. They cheat. They scheme. They lie about you, gossip about you, try to tear you down. Does that ever bother you? Does it ever bother you that it seems like the ones that do the worst things prosper? Does it seem like that God doesn't care that I mean, if you were God, you'd handle it. You'd take care of it. You'd make sure that they get exactly what they deserve, right? Does it ever bother you that sometimes God is quiet, silent when evil goes on? I think wonder, maybe David was thinking about King Saul when he wrote this psalm. When he was the young boy that was out in the fields King Saul was on the throne, even though Samuel had come and anointed him as the king. He wasn't on the throne. He was still out there dealing with the dumb sheep. And the anointing of God left King Saul, and a bothersome spirit came upon him. 
Matter of fact, someone said, I know this young boy by the name of David, and he plays an instrument well, he sings well. Maybe we can get him to come into the king when, when he is bothered by this troublesome spirit. And they called David, and he did that. And, and whenever David would play and sing to praises to the Lord in front of him, Saul's heart would be soothed, soothed down, and he would, he would be lifted up and, and feel good again. But then... That, by the way, that was before David killed Goliath. And Saul got to know him in a little better way. And, and, and David began to go out and lead the armies, and Saul liked that. But then Saul became jealous of David. A teenager. He became jealous of him and wanted to kill him. Matter of fact, on more than one occasion, he took a spear and threw it at David, trying to kill him. Literally, it says, pin him to the wall. And he got so much in him that he wanted all of his leaders against David. He wanted all of his army to go against David, not because he had done anything wrong. And David, who had been faithful to God, became a fugitive. Maybe he was thinking about all that he had to face with King Saul. But when he was older and he looked back on it, he had a word that he wanted to share it was a song of his heart that I pray that we could learn to sing as well. In verse 1 it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. That word fret's not a word that we use a lot. Y'all use that word in your everyday... I mean, when was the last time you looked at someone and said, Oh, I've been fretting all morning long. I mean, that's just not one of the words that we use. But we kind of know what it means, don't we? It, it, the root word is a word that means to burn. Now, did y'all know that y'all have a pilot light that's lit inside of all of y'all? Do y'all know what I'm talking about with a pilot light? If you've got a water heater at home, there's a little pilot light that is there. And when it needs to, the, it pours the gas to it and the, and the air to it, and that little bitty flame will kick up, and it will just, it will just get that water to boiling. Or you may have it in, the, in your heater in your house, and it's cold, and you turn on the heat, and that little pilot light will flame up, and then all of a sudden you feel the, all the heat going through the house. Did y'all know that y'all have a little, one of those little pilot lights that's in you? And it's just flickering down there. It's just nice little small flame. But then something will happen. Somebody, y'all know them, and they'll say something. And they're, all of a sudden, the pilot light grows a little bit. And then you start seeing it, and you start hearing it, and, you're, and all of a sudden, something begins to happen in you, and the thermostat turns, and all of a sudden, the air the, starts pouring against it, and all of a sudden, that flame flames up. And the next thing you know, there's a small roaring fire within you. That is the absolute picture of this word fretting. I mean, you're fine. Everything's in control. Everything's good. Then all of a sudden, this, this thing begins to happen. It's like a volcano that begins to erupt within you. And all this nasty stuff starts boiling out and billowing around. And all of a sudden, it's just this, this poison that's there. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And it just comes almost uncontrollably upon you. And David has this word, stop it, quit it. Did your parents ever use those words with you? I mean, you're doing it and you're, you're about to, you're, you're getting there. My mom used to have this great phrase. I never knew exactly where it was, but she said, you about found my last nerve. I was an expert at it. I could find the very last one that she had, and that meant something was about to change within her. And when it changed within her, I had places on my body that began to warm up as well. There's this fretting that God says it bothers us, and we need to stop it. All of us are prone to it. I mean, we can call it different things, righteous indignation. 
That means when we think that we're right and, and we just think that that's wrong and it shouldn't be that way, and we just get, in a holy way, we get set on flame. Uh-huh, right? I mean, we have a way of justifying all of these things. Sometimes this burning turns to a churning that goes on in our life. And anxiety will begin to come up within us and worry. And it changes our thinking. And it changes into stress. A lot of us have heard the doctor say hypertension. We have heart troubles. If you want to have a stroke, go ahead. There's a lot of people been working on one for quite a while. They let all these things come in. He says, stop it. Don't let this thing become the attitude of your life. You need to do a 180. Paul said in Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. You know, there's a, something that goes on in our life. Do you ever get angry with God? You ever get angry with God when you think He's not doing right? You ever get angry with God when it seems like He lets evil things happen? As a pastor, that's the thing that's probably surprised me more than anything else is when people come and they say, I'm just mad at God. By the way, I, I shouldn't say this, but would y'all forgive me? That's stupid. That's silly. God who cannot do wrong, why in the world would you be mad at him? If there's a misunderstanding there, it's not on God's part. He's God. It's on our part. And just because his ways are beyond our ways and his thoughts are beyond our thoughts, that doesn't mean it's his fault. And what good does it do to get mad at God? But yet, so often we do because we're trying to bring God down to our level. Let me just share a few quick things for you. Number one, don't ever prejudge God's reaction to things. David said, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass whoosh, and wither as the green herb. Y'all like that word soon? Is it ever soon enough? I mean, maybe the problem is, is that God's soon and your soon's not the same thing. Matter of fact, I like it very much that God is patient, long-suffering, and kind. Anybody in here grateful that God is the God of grace and mercy? I mean, patient. Aren't you grateful that he's patient? That means that he's patient in, in circumstances. But the word long-suffering means that he suffers long with people. And a thousand times that I've messed, let him down, a thousand times that I've messed up, I'm grateful that he was patient in my circumstances. I'm grateful that he was long-suffering with me and kind to me. As a matter of fact, you are too when he's that way to you. But we don't understand when he is that way with others because we see God as being, listen to me now, inactive. And when we think God is inactive, we think God is wrong. Perspective is the key. What God wants is redemption. And when you look at when God does, by the way, he's never early and he's never late. He's always right on time. And he doesn't come up short and he doesn't go too far. He always is at the exact right place doing the exact right thing at the exact right time for his glory and for our benefit. We just need to calm down and let God be God. You know, against the backdrop of eternity, things change. He says soon. Look what he says in verse 7 here. And at the end of verse 7, he says, Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. 
There are times in this world when people are going through things and they're doing all the wrong things. We look at them and we say, why is it that God is allowing that person to prosper? Do you see it? It seems like they get by with it. They've got all these wicked schemes that they're doing, and, and we're the beneficiaries of their ugliness. Why doesn't God settle it? Why, does it? why is it that they're prospering? Why is it that the one who cheats gets rich? Why is it the one who lies seems to get by with it? Why is it the one who, who doesn't care for others? Why is it that so much is done for them? Look what it says in verse 8, cease from anger, forsake wrath, don't fret. It only causes, what's the word? Harm not to them, harm to you. You're fretting when that burning, churning, turning in your stomach, when all those butterflies are going crazy, when all that volcano is erupting, you're the one that's being hurt by it. Matter of fact, when you see those evil people and it looks like they're prospering, it doesn't seem like they have a worry in the world. But you're the one that's getting turned upside down. He says plainly, stop fretting because it's hurting you. It's hurting you. Psalms 30 verse 5 says this, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen? You know there's an opposite to that. The partying and the ugliness and the sin and the negativity and the hardship. They may enjoy it for a night, but judgment comes in the morning. There is a reckoning day that is coming. And it's not me that will give them that reckoning. It's God that will give them that reckoning. Look what it says. He says, the fire that's burning within you, let it go. By the way, as, as a pastor, I will tell you, that one of the things that is the most detrimental to Christians today is unforgiveness. Someone else has done something, but because someone else did something, they're affected by it. And because they don't learn to forgive, they're the one that's being hurt by it. Unforgiveness only hurts you. The quicker you can learn to forgive, the quicker you're going to learn peace. Look what it says in verse number 9. For evildoers shall be cut off. Jonathan Edwards, back in the 1700s, a very famous preacher, met in the first great awakening in America, he was one of the leaders in it. And, and he used to read his sermons. They said he had a big long nose and he would put the, his glasses on the end of his nose and he would read his sermons. And people, there was so much of an anointing upon it, people would quake. They would sit, literally shake. And one of his sermons that he was so popular for, for, for preaching was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it was like God was holding the string and a sinner was holding on to that string and the fire of hell, eternity, all the 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 negativity of hell forever and ever and ever was right there. And they were just holding on by a string. And here's the thing. God so, mo so much wanted to reach his hand down and rescue that sinner and keep them from the pits of hell. But as they dangled there on it, there was a day, as it says in verse 9, that they would be cut off. And literally, Jonathan Edwards would say, God would take his scissors and so cut that thread and they would fall into an eternity, separated from God and his love forever. Look what it says there in verse 9. For evildoers shall be, not might be, if they hold on to that evil, they shall be cut off. Look what it says in verse 10. For yet a little while, once again, it's a perspective. In, in a moment, the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. He's gone. It doesn't look like that sometimes. As a matter of fact, sometimes it looks like the, the wicked that they're taken to the victory place and they're put up on a podium where, where they can receive all the victories from their sin and their evil. But then it's like God walks up and arrests them and binds their hands and leads them away. It may look good 
when they're getting all the accolades of all of their evil works. But understand that God says they'll be cut off. And by the way, you won't even, you, you'll look for them. But you can't find them. They may win in this world, or it may look like they win in this world. But you'll say, where are they? They're gone. I don't even know where they're at. Look what it says in verse 12. The wicked plots against the just, gnashes at him with his teeth. Boy, that's graphic, isn't it? The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. I mean, we can see it when the wicked are out there and how evil they are, and it looks like they're just chewing us up and spitting us out. God looks at it and says, you think you're so smart? He laughs at that. When Satan, Lucifer, by the way, Ezekiel said that when God created Lucifer, he was full of wisdom and beauty. It doesn't mean he was the most beautiful. It doesn't mean that he had all wisdom, but he was full of wisdom and beauty. And Satan thought he was as good as God. And my goodness, we think sometimes when we look at this world, we say, doesn't it look like Satan's winning? He's defeated. He's on a downward spiral. And, and to compare, though, though God gave him great blessing and wisdom, understand this, to compare that with Almighty God is like comparing day and night. Totally 180 difference. God looks at their wisdom and he laughs at it. You think you know so very much, all oh, you know, look at verse number 14. The wicked have drawn their sword. They've bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who have upright conduct. I mean, they're pulling their sword out because they want to hurt you. They're bending back their bow because they want to shoot their arrows through you. But look what he says in the next verse. He said, their sword shall enter their own heart. They may draw their sword to hurt you, but it's only going to hurt them. They may bend their bow back to bring harm to you, but their bow will break. Our God will not let anything come against you. Corinthians, Paul said, no weapon, for, weapon formed against you shall prosper. Evil has been defeated. Jesus won. He is alive. He is on the throne. He hears your prayers. He is preparing a place for you. He said that while you're on this earth, He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You're never going to be short as long as you have a hold of the Almighty. Don't prejudge it. Don't misunderstand God. It harms you when you try to bring God down to your level. Learn from Him. Experience God. See His ways. David is looking back on it, and he's like, maybe I didn't follow you. Maybe I, I sinned with Bathsheba, and I, I, I killed her husband. But Lord, even though I was so wretched when I did that, you still loved me. You still gave me mercy. You still redeemed me with an everlasting love. And by the way, there's not one person in here who hasn't messed up and is not worthy of hell. But the goodness of God doesn't want that for us. He wants to not give us all that Satan deserves. He wants to give us it all Jesus has. Child of the King. I can't get over this. Joint heir with Christ. Oh, what a mighty God. So let me just ask you. I've read the book. Maybe you have too. Who wins in the end? Amen? Amen? Who's still on the throne? Who's preparing a place for you of peace? Sometimes when, you're, when you see the ugliness of the world, you need to get your mind off of it and you need to look at heaven. There will be no ugliness in heaven. There will be no gossip or lies in heaven. 
There will be none of that uh, evil that goes on, the one who has all the wicked schemes. No, not in heaven. Just the redeemed of the Lord who've let Jesus be Lord of their life. I mean, just a few seconds in when you're in the glory, in the, in the, in the, in the presence of the Almighty, when you feel the splendor of the warmth of His embrace, when, you, when your eyes are open to all of the beauty that your heart could only dream of, and you know that everything has been placed in the... It, it's good, it's right, and it's forevermore then the things of earth will will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Why should we worry? Why should we fret? Why can't we trust the one who is already the winner? My dear friends, there is victory in Jesus. But you've got to allow Jesus to be Lord. Why is it the ones who know Him the most sometimes judge God the most, get angry at God the most? It's simply being short-sighted. It's a misunderstanding. and You're only hurting yourself. Please hear the encouraging words of the Holy Spirit. He has so much more planned for you.